Today we have another Hometown Historian Channel production. Enjoy. So this is Alden Villa. This is actually a home uh, mansion in Cornwall, Pennsylvania. Uh, it's on the National Register of Historic Places, I believe in 2011 is when it was put on there. It, uh, it was a home that was paid for by Anna Coleman Alden for her son, P Robert Percy Alden and uh, his bride, Mary Ida Warren. So this was a wedding gift. Uh, this is the connection to the Coleman family. The Coleman family had come, become connected with the Alden family, and the Alden family, uh, they were of renown from as far back as the Mayflower, John Alden. Uh, they were involved with different commercial businesses, but were quite wealthy, and that was sort of the social circle type thing, is that you married within these appropriate social circles, and the Alden family fit that. They were from New York City. Uh, but also from New England because of the Mayflower, Plymouth, uh, Massachusetts connection. But uh, this home uh, we'll go into first. Uh, we'll talk about Stanford White a little bit later, but he was quite the renowned architect, and uh, he was part of the firm McKim, Mead, and White, and they had wound up getting involved with the Aldens and also the Warren family. Uh, I believe Warren family, somewhere in her family, an uncle or something like that, had owned the Mohawk and Hudson Railroad, which eventually had been bought by Cornelius Vanderbilt. Uh, it was actually a railroad that was bought on good terms, from what I know, because they continued a relationship with him. Because a lot of the stuff, like, you, know, you would have these hostile takeovers back then. But So these families were all, all interconnected. And through that connection, they wound up, being connected to Stanford White, and they decided and this was this was a firm at this time that they were just starting. So their first big job was this Alden Villa. It was the first home. So let's go into a little bit of some of the cool aspects of this home. Uh, this is it is done sort of in a Tudor mansion, sort of English country house style. Uh, it, it's not only sort of that Victorian style. Uh, but also it goes into sort of the shingle style. So it, it, it's a unique looking uh, house and it, it's really pretty as you'll see the pictures of the inside and outside. Uh, the westward wing of the mansion, it juts out displaying a bank of eight stained glass panels atop a central door flanked by two additional stained glass panels. And this is one of the things that's pretty neat about this place and one of the things with them restoring it right now that's one of the focuses it's it's the roof is a focus uh the windows those types of things doors sort of to keep any weather from getting in because there had been some issues with the previous folks that had bought it they had gotten the carriage house completely done and restored beautifully back to the original style and everything but then i guess one of them ran into financial difficulties there was some suing going on and then in 2021, uh, this gentleman that we'll talk about then, he bought it. He's from Africa, so he's local, but he has a real intrinsic uh, value to these old buildings. And he felt as though I'm the guy that's going to come along and save this and try to figure out how, how what use to put it to, but to take it back to its original uh, look and all that. And, and it's important that you have that. And it, it's quite the financial burden, too, you think about you know, not only because it is such an exquisite home and they use very different materials that are a lot harder to come by, but also because of the National Registry of Historic Places status, you also have to be very stringent in the way that you go about doing things. So you can't cut corners. 
and so it's much more expensive in that way. So I think he's looking at using it as possibly like a wedding venue as it gets updated to sort of help offset some of the costs because it really at this stage will be unknown what it will cost to actually fix this up. But kudos to him um, on doing so because uh, his name is Harvey J. Turner the fourth. Really cool dude, and they say here uh, off the Alden Project uh, website, they do say it's the courageous task of restoring a mansion, and it is because you really don't know what you're walking into with a place like this and how much it's going to cost, and, and and he's determined to get it done, and I believe he will. And uh, I had gone there to just check it out to see if I could film, and unfortunately it is posted. You're able to drive up to, like, the carriage house, but you can't really drive beyond that. And uh, But I wanted to do a video on this, not only because of the Coleman connection, but also because of the importance of this house and the fact that they actually are trying to restore this place and take it back to uh, its original grandeur. And uh, that's something that doesn't always happen, unfortunately. But uh, in this case, it is. And this is being given new life and hopefully live on for generations to come. Because uh, they were they were having a lot of trouble with vandalism, uh, the decay, the roof had broken open, I guess, a couple places, so there was a lot of leaking and those types of things. So it was just a matter of time if this gentleman hadn't stepped in that this place was going to be destroyed and be lost. I mean, we've seen places with National Historic uh, Registry status, like the Mitch Michter's uh, Brewery out near Schaeferstown, that's gone because it just wasn't taken care of. And... Thankfully, this place isn't going to have the same fate. But uh, it's renowned for a number of different features that it has, one being the stained glass. And it's not necessarily the traditional stained glass that you think of when you think of stained glass, but it's like lightly colored glass, but really beautiful, especially from the inside. Um, they have uh, also... Uh, 200 small sections of glass, most of them clear, but many various pastel blues, oranges, greens, yellows, and reds. And each window has a central square and uh, circle or diamond with tree and floral shape. So it's really pretty and intricate. Uh, and they have uh, one of the panels, I believe, includes a date the home was finished in 1881 in Roman numerals. Uh, each window by itself is brilliant, but the combined effect is mesmerizing. Uh, the date in the windows is echoed on the currently exposed plaster in the formal diner room with the writing Garfield, President uh, Garfield dead November 19th, 1881. So that would be underneath. It wasn't meant to be exposed, but it's still it's a pretty neat detail that's there. And that's the type of stuff that you run into from time to time with these places that uh, they want to have these details hidden below the surface, whether it's whatever it might be, hidden rooms and that type of stuff that you wind up finding some real treasures uh, from history. Uh, it also has um, a really cool uh, woven wicker dining room ceiling, which is the only one that's still existent in the country. And the cool thing is the total cost of the construction was only $30,000, which is quite impressive. I mean, back then that was a lot of money, but you think about, too, how that was built and everything that was done with it. Uh, from the different features and the different types of materials that were used. Uh, they have a ball, uh, actually a grand barrel ceiling in the ballroom, which uh, I believe there are some pictures of that we'll have. But uh, it's a pretty, pretty neat place. Um, dining room has a built-in uh, buffet similar to the other mansions that he did, like Kings Coat in Newport, Rhode Island. So there were some things that he took from this particular mansion and incorporated those into later buildings that he would design as well. Now the family. Uh, and I said earlier, uh, this was built as a wedding present to Robert Percy Alden, the son of Ann Coleman Alden, and uh, would serve more as a summer home. Um, Another sort of cool design note is actually Mary Ida's brother, Whitney Warren, designed Grand Central Station, and that sort of shows that the continued relationship with the Vanderbilt, since Cornelius Vanderbilt, or Vanderbilt was the one that had Grand Central Station built, uh, and he actually had taken their railroad, the Mohawk and Hudson, and combined it into the New York Central, which was one of the biggest uh, at the time, uh, railroads of the time. Uh, the last of the Coleman's or Aldens to live there was uh, John Percy Coleman Alden, who actually died on Christmas Eve in 1948. 
and then the mansion was auctioned off the following year. And they actually had uh, one of these unions, uh, the Amalgamated Clothing Workers of America, uh, one of their members bought it. Sort of the idea was, because there was like 500 acres with it, to make it a sort of as a resort, because there were a lot of shirt factories and things like that in the area. So they wanted to have it as a resort, as a getaway for the union workers. And they actually did that for quite a while until it started being sold off once they no longer used it. But they had some pretty cool stuff. Like they even made like a little, a little pond lake on the property with like sand for a beach. So it was, they didn't spare too much expense and trying to make it a really neat place for the workers to be able to go to. So it was, it's a cool bit of history that thanks to a number of different people has been preserved. Uh, and today and, and has continued to be restored and hopefully it'll be restored fully to the point where it is back to the original and uh, people can enjoy that for years and years to come. So you can't talk about Alden Villa without talking about Stanford White who was the architect. Uh, he was well renowned uh, and he also had quite the story to his life which we'll go into here. Uh, he was born November 9, 1853, and died June 25, 1906, which plays into this a whole lot. Uh, he was a partner in the architectural firm McKim, Mead, and White, which was one of the most significant Bouza uh, firms. I believe I said that in the French appropriate way, but it was the type of uh, Gilded Age Victorian architectural styles, uh, which was very popular during the Gilded Age. Uh, he designed many houses for the rich, uh, in addition to numerous civic, institutional, and religious buildings. Uh, he was renowned for his temporary Washington Square arch. It was so popular that he was commissioned to design a permanent one. Uh, his design principles uh, embodied this American Renaissance in uh, the Gilded Age. <laughs> Some of the buildings that he designed was uh, Rosecliff, which was an important mansion up in Newport, Rhode Island, Madison Square Garden, uh, the second one, uh, Washington Square Arch in New York City, the New York Herald Building, the Savoy Center in Detroit, Lovely Lane Methodist Church in Baltimore, the Rhode Island State House in Providence, Rhode Island, and the University of Virginia Rotunda, which had originally had burnt down and then he designed a new one. Um, in 1906, this is where it gets interesting, White was shot and killed in Madison Square Theater by Harry Kendall Thaw in front of a large audience during a musical theater performance. Thaw was a wealthy but mentally unstable heir of a coal and railroad fortune who had become obsessed by White's alleged drugging and rape, rape and subsequent relationship with his wife, Evelyn Nesbitt, which started when she was 16, four years before their marriage. Uh, she had married Thaw in 1905 and was a famous fashion model who was performing as an actress in the show. With the elements of the sex scandal among the wealthy and the public killing, the resulting sensational trial of Thaw was dubbed the trial of the century by contemporary reporters. Thaw was ultimately found not guilty by reason of insanity. So going into it a little deeper, I guess he had, he was in those high social circles and somehow knew this lady's family and I guess he was given some kind of charge with her, and I guess this whole thing probably did happen. And then, weirdly, you know, just because of the psychological aspects of it, they wound up becoming lovers, I guess, for a while, and then eventually drifted apart. And that's when she married Thaw. Apparently, he found out about it, become jealous, and viewed uh, Stanford White as a rival and had been planning for a while, how can I get him, how can I get him, how can I get him? And I guess they were eating out earlier in the evening before the show. He saw him at the restaurant and decided he was gonna do it. Uh, White was at the uh, theater and he shot him, I think twice in the head and once in the chest and then he was killed instantly. But uh, it, was, it was one of those things that a lot of people were really upset about it, especially his family, because basically his character was ruined because his romance and his sexual life came to the forefront and apparently wasn't a very good dude, you know, obviously with the drugging and raping of this uh, lady. But uh, so it was, it was very interesting. He's been in popular culture, I believe, in the new show, The Gilded Age. He's actually in that show his character 
and uh, but he made quite the impact in uh, in architectural style and those types of things, and was quite renowned. And the uh, Alden Villa is actually the very first uh, personal home that their firm did and that he designed. And he also designed the carriage house, which is there. So uh, quite important to this home, uh, quite important to uh, architecture, and quite an interesting story. Uh, sad and, uh, you know, it's one of those things. You live a, a life that's a bit too vicarious, and you live one that's not a good life. It can catch up with you from time to time, and that's what basically happened in this regard. But uh, that's the life of Stanford White, who uh, designed Alden Villa. So thanks for coming along to this visit to the Alden Villa and uh, talking about its history, the people that were involved with it, the architects, the style, and all that. And uh, as always, we will see you all about town.